We want to hear the stories from the courses that you've taught. Whether in a lab, a classroom, kitchen, on Zoom or in a shop. Drawing on your expertise, we'll ask the probing questions. What goes right and what goes wrong when teaching your favorite lesson? Hello, everybody. Welcome back to My Favorite Lesson, a podcast hosted by Teaching and Learning at Conestoga College. My name is Dr. Lauren Spring, and I feel very grateful to be sitting here today with Crystal Shad who is a professor in Conestoga's School of Interdisciplinary Studies. Hello, Crystal. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for being here today. You're most welcome. Thank you for having me. And I should let listeners know that we have had to reschedule this interview numerous times, and so I'm extra grateful that we're actually <laughs> making it happen <laughs> right now today, because um, I've been so looking forward to speaking with Crystal. So why don't we start off, Crystal, if you don't mind, um, just telling us a little bit about your journey to Conestoga. What, what brought you here? Faculty have all sorts of different paths that have led them to teaching and to this college in particular. What was it for you? Well, I don't think anybody's going to have the same path as me. As my <laughs> father, Dwayne Shad, actually taught at the college ever since oh. I was two. So um, I actually grew up and I can honestly say in the fitness field at the college, running around the little track in the old um, in the old gym no way. Um, ever since I was about two years old. So I was surrounded by students. I'd come in and, you know, on, uh, I guess, get things ready for testing and that kind of stuff. So that's how I actually sort of kind of weaseled my way I guess, <laughs> into the college that way. I also worked at the college. Um, in my younger years, I guess 14 starting um, for the camps that they used to run. So day camps or summer camps. So and my dad ran those as well. So I sort of kind of got in through that. In, and that was how I actually, I guess, laid out the, the plan for myself. Now, how I actually started at the college myself. It wasn't necessarily through my dad in that way. But um, at about 2007, after I had my daughter, I had just finished my professional athletic career, and I was, as I was going through that, I was um, obtaining, going back to school, obtaining lots of the top um, certifications for fitness and um, other things of that nature in massage therapy as well. Wow. Um, and at that point, I had been asked by one of my dad's colleagues to actually come in and interview uh, for a fitness position uh, for the community mm -hmm. services. So that's actually how I got in. And that was Colleen, actually Colleen Holmes um, Cummings that was, that actually approached me for that. So I, I was oh. thankful for that, for that opportunity. And that's how I got in. And that was through the health sciences department um, for a fitness is for the police, fire and paramedics. Wow. Okay. So you've said so many things that yeah. I want to pick up on here. Um, going back to you as this little kid running around the track at Conestoga, what was your dad teaching at the college? Um, so he was still, he actually just retired probably like really? two years ago now. Oh, amazing. Um, and it was within the health science, or actually he was liberal studies. It used to be considered liberal studies and all the fitness aspects of that. And he was, he became the coordinator of the community service for the fitness and that kind of stuff. So that's what he was teaching at that time. Super. Okay. And yeah, for folks maybe listening outside of Conestoga or outside of this school, that would be, you know, programs essentially that have a fitness component, like, like uh, firefighting, Correct. like yep. paramedics, those kinds of things, right? Correct. Yes. Policing. Yeah. Um, and then you just sort of casually said your your athletic career. Can you expand a little bit? I, I have a feeling. With my athletic career? Yeah, yeah. This, is, um, this is extensive. So <laughs> um, because I, and it was funny because I, like I said, I got started at the college because my dad would, we'd go to the gym mm -hmm. on the weekends and throw out balls. And, and my dad was a basketball player. So I actually started out training as a basketball player and, and doing other sports. But I went to train with a coach who was our Canadian Olympic coach and uh, um, for Canada for track and field. And I went to train for speed training. And mm -hmm. his name was Brent McFarland. Um, and with that, I went in my first year, I started even trying different modalities or, or different events as well. And 
that led me into, I guess, at Stanley Park, which is a school, we're in grade seven, eight school at uh, in Kitchener with a teacher, Mr. Hooks. Now, triple jump wasn't an event for women at that time. So the really? boys would be, yeah, the boys would be learning how to do triple jump. And I was supposed to be paying attention to the long jumpers or the, the mm-hmm. girls were doing long jump. And I sort of kind of weaseled my way or lost my way somehow watching the, the boys <laughs> jump. And Mr. Hooks yelled, Shad, come over here. Um, and I thought I was in trouble. Huh. So he actually, he was like, do you want to learn how to triple jump? And I was like, yeah, because I was over. So what he saw me doing was actually trying to do the triple jump in the field as the boys were learning it. That was my first taste in the triple jump. And the year after that, I became the junior Canadian record holder um, when I started out my track career the next year. So it moved really fast. And that's sort of kind of how I got started with my my track career and and, uh, into sports. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, and that's just so touching to picture you in the field kind of like, hmm, I wonder if I could do that. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> you sure can. Yes. Um, and what was it like then if it was primarily, it w- this wasn't just within your school that it was only boys who were No, doing so it, it was within was, the world. Wow. So it was not an event in, I guess, at the Olympics until 1990 and 92. So in 91 is when I actually started my career in grade nine. Um, and um, I didn't, my coach was a sprint and hurdle coach. So I didn't have a jumps coach. It was just based on my speed. Okay. And from there became the Canadian record holder. And then going to my first Olympic trials at age 15 um, Whoa. in 92 and ended up second against the university girls and that kind of stuff. And every country was supposed to send two athletes, two jumpers to represent the country. And I was, I was ranked 12th in the world uh, by that point. Um, but unfortunately Canada did not send any female triple jumpers that year. And that's, that's a whole other discussion of that. And that's actually within my Olympic course, uh, that I have created with the OLC. And that was, um, it's something that's actually quite common of, you know, athletes making a standard and not going, but yeah, that was sort of kind of my debut, I guess, in the professional aspect of, of track and field. Wow. Yeah. And how did you, I mean, that must have been, that period must have been like a mix of a lot of excitement and thrill, <laughs> but then huge disappointment if you got second and then couldn't actually go to the well, Olympics for it. At eight, like when you're 15, like 14, 15, I didn't really think about it like that at, at the time. I think I was more disappointed like years later. Mm-hmm. Um, at the time I just knew, okay, I got second against all these university girls. And I learned after that my coach and several of the other Canadian coaches that found out their excuse was that I was too young. So mm-hmm. Canada had a rule that you had to be 17 to compete. Mm-hmm. Um, they went and I guess protested and appealed and lost the appeals. So I, apparently there were three appeals put in oh, wow. to have me try to compete Um, and those were all lost. And so I wasn't, I'll be honest, I didn't know anything, uh, Mm -hmm. at that time I was so oblivious and, and even to the sport. And even right after I finished jumping my last jump, I, a lady walked up to me and I was drug tested, picked for drug testing. And I remember walking in with Mark McCoy, all the big names of, of Canada at that time. And there's little me walking in and being drug tested and they were (laughs) laughing. Yeah, they were laughing like, you're going to test her? Like, what the heck does she look like she took? Like, you know, it was it was it it was surreal because I I was surrounded by people that I was motivated by. Right. But the I guess that turned that did change as later on realizing um, this was not the first time that Canada didn't select me to go. Um, either to the Olympics or an international and then finding out it's happening. It's more common because there were a lot of athletes that weren't picked for specific reasons. And that's just something Canada has to work on. But yeah, I didn't get, I wasn't upset at the, at the moment. I was, I was young. (laughs) Yeah, no, that must've been a, like you're saying, you use the word surreal and I can imagine, (laughs) you know, out from that field, just at practice, watching the boys do it. And then, whoa, where are you now? But, um, what are some of those reasons that you think Canada hasn't sent particular athletes? Um, 
Well, I, I do know a lot of the reasons and it gets very touchy. So I do have to also be careful with what I say because my daughter is also competing and my daughter didn't get selected for world juniors because she, and she was ranked third in the world mm -hmm. um, because she was only 15. So it was mm -hmm. like a replay at yeah. that moment. But um, some of the reasons I just, I, I really can't go sure. into de full detail on here yeah. because it does get very touchy and, and let's just, we'll put it at politics. Okay. That's what it comes down to. Mm. Okay. You just mentioned your daughter. So you're kind of reliving this now <laughs> through her in some ways, right? We were yes. just talking off air how talented she is and um, different sport, not a triple jumper, but um, what is that like? Sort of, we're, we're um, going to move more into your teaching yeah, momentarily, yeah. but no, but. That, and that's, and actually it all fits in of, um, because my coach Brent McFarland had us coach other kids and I was one of the younger ones. So I had a chance and an opportunity to, um, coach at the Olympic training center in San Diego. And I was like 15, 16, and I'm walking amongst <laughs> like Edwin Moses and all these Olympians Whoa. that have won medals and I'm coaching them on how to warm up properly. And that's what got me started. And I really loved it biomechanically. Now that brings mm -hmm. me to my daughter and she's just gifted, but it allowed me to actually help her being that I've had an amateur and a pro career. She's much more advanced than I am. Uh, she's in the long jump. So she's a long jumper and ranked, um, in, so she's 16 now, and she's been ranked anywhere top five in the world for mm. from her age. She's top in the world from, I guess, U23 and hope, hoping right now to make the Olympic standard um, next year. And she's not far off of that at all. But she's also a volleyball player. And mm. she is she is committed, verbally committed to the University of Wisconsin, who's won NCAAs and and she's one of the top volleyball players um, in Ontario, and she plays for Team Canada as well for volleyball for the juniors. So yeah. it, it's exciting, but at the same time, I have to let her develop um, mm -hmm. and just support her just like I would support my students in, in everything. And, it, and so it all combines, and people don't realize that sports do help you, and even with teaching and so forth, when you're, when you're coaching and teaching, it's the exact same thing. <laughs> oh, I imagine, huh? Yeah. What do you think are some of the... The crossovers between coaching and teaching? Uh, the biggest one that I've noticed, and especially over the years, would be mental health. So mm -hmm. it's the mental aspect. So whether it's teaching or coaching, mental health is always going to be there. And of course, with COVID coming or having already been through, mm -hmm. the change in the mentality of a lot of a lot of students and athletes has it's went downhill. Their confidence is not there. So it's my job as a coach and as a teacher to make sure I'm listening fully to athletes or students mm -hmm. and helping them to grow. Because the whole point of teaching and coaching is to make them better than you. It's not <laughs> like that's the that's the whole goal is to make mm -hmm. them, you know, better than you. So then they can go out and reach the not only just their goal, but start, you know, uh, inventing mm -hmm. stuff that become that makes our society better. That's the mm -hmm. whole point of that. So. Um, that's going to be the big one. Another one that we see is obviously learning different, like different learning styles. So in the classroom, we define that obviously the learning styles as, you know, you can have somebody that's bodily kinesthetic. So they're very hands-on mm -hmm. and I'm hands-on. A lot of, they say a lot of athletes are hands-on because they have to actually go through the motion. Mm -hmm. That's the same in the learning environment because we have people that are thinkers. So you sort of kind of have to tend to those that, you know, um, it gets a little wordy, but it will get them to think off, um, sort of kind of on the spot. And then we have the visuals that actually need to see something. Mm -hmm. um, so it's touching base on that. Well, it's no different than coaching. And mm -hmm. coaching, we actually, I'll be honest, there's a, it's like teachers. So some teachers can adapt their lessons to different classes. Every term or every, I shouldn't even say every term, every section is going to be different. Right. And you have to um, apply everything that you possibly can to make them successful. Well, it's the same with coaching. We get new kids in. Not only that, I coach multi-sports. So I coach volleyball players, basketball players, and track and field athletes. So it's it's now adapting to that because they all have different abilities as well. And that's the same yeah. in the classroom. We have people that need accessibility services, and that's in both 
uh, like, you know, on the field, uh, anything mm-hmm. of that nature. And it's, it's just learning to be quick on your feet with the thinking and, and applying that to your lessons. Was that, I mean, it's, it sounds like career trajectory, trajectory wise that started for you in, in the coaching realm. Was that challenging at first, that idea of like, you know, you're really good at a sport, you know what to do, but then actually getting through to someone and then, you know, someone else who's maybe competing in the exact same sport, but getting through to them in a different way. Was that tricky at first to navigate um, as a young coach? No, I, I think the thing that was that was tricky was I knew I was much younger than a lot of the mm-hmm. a lot of the people that I was actually supposed to go out and train. I remember the very first time walking in and looking at these big world renowned coaches and um, athletes that I saw on TV at the Olympics, and I was like, "Oh, one day I'm going to be there." You know, it was just sort of kind of like that, and then all of a sudden. Okay, well, lead them in the warm up. And not only that, not only did I have to lead them, I had to explain why we did what we did in the warm up. And from there, because my coach was also in kinesiology, I, and then my dad also being in the fitness field, I started falling in love with learning about the human body. Mm-hmm. And from there, it actually became easy for me. So I, I picked that stuff up in terms of delivering that to each individual athletes so not just a team even if it's a team sport it's individual athletes um I think the only tricky part is knowing each athlete personally yeah yeah I guess and that you know to me in my imagination translates directly to the classroom too right because you can have this great lesson but you know it's gonna really be effective for certain learners and and maybe less so for others and and then it's about getting to know them (laughs) over the semester and adapting you know, to, yeah. to what their, their needs are. Absolutely. And, wow. Yeah. And what an interesting dynamic to be, not be allowed to compete because you're only 15 and yet be like coaching <laughs> these much it, older athletes. You know, I think you're the first person that actually brought that up. And now I'm like, uh, yeah, I didn't even think of that. And that that's actually, yeah, that's so true. Like, you know, <laughs> not being able to compete for my country because I was too young, but being able to go and coach world-class athletes, travel with my coach and coach world-class athletes was, yeah, I, I didn't think of that. So, <laughs> And did you have at that time, um, did you receive any pushback from some of these pros? Like who is this, this young woman coming in? Or was it just kind of, you know, others had vetted you and, and you, no. you were so good at what you're doing? Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't from the, the those that were Olympians and pro athletes. I mm-hmm. actually received more flack from my own teammates here which they were my age and I think it was because I excelled like I met some of these people have been training for a long time and here I am I walk in the first year oh set the Canadian junior Canadian record and then the (laughs) next year oh qualify for like you know the Olympic team and um there was a lot of jealousy and that's and that's something that that you face anywhere you go so it doesn't uh it doesn't just go uh, subside to like sports it's also you know at work so mm-hmm. getting to you know uh field things at work and that kind of stuff with teaching and 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 that's actually part of when I teach I, I don't I don't care what course it is I go into that like you know you got to try your best I think I'm more of a motivator mm-hmm. of especially those that don't do well so that kind of stuff if somebody's jealous or whatever it it doesn't bother me because I've dealt with it mm-hmm. in another sense but um, yeah, not not too much of a flack out there with the professionals. It was more with my peers, like people my age. Wow. That's a powerful thing to have learned how to deal with at such a young age, though, because I think a lot of folks <laughs> are haunted Most by definitely. that, you know, yes. throughout, throughout their adult lives. Yeah. And, to and my daughter's to... dealing with it now. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it was it was something hard because having some of her teammates that she had played with, um, post stuff on and social media is huge now so yeah. posting stuff on social media whereas we didn't have social media it was like either you heard it mm-hmm. talk they talked right behind you or talked to your face but social media and and she did have a little bit of a downfall and and having to sort of kind of pull her up and explain to her look you're a great athlete mm-hmm. and people aren't they're not going to care. They're going to, there's a lot of jealous people out there. They're going to say hurtful things and now's the time to learn it. So, I mean, and I go through that even in my class of student success, like we talk about um, communication and relationships, like, you know, and, and that's, you're, that's something normal and it's going to be our response that stands out strong. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and you had mentioned already sort of mental health and how that has, you know, you've noticed since the pandemic that this is like a, a thing amongst your students and amongst those that you're coaching. Um, how do you think that's manifesting kind of in the classroom and in your coaching sessions right now? Okay, um, I'll start off with, with the coaching because I can bring that into how I actually bring it into the classroom. With coaching, um, once I finished my athletic career, I suffered f- with my own sort of kind of depression because when you finish an athletic career and and so forth, it you don't know what to do with yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was thankful because I did have a good education. And while I was doing my professional career, I kept going back to school instead mm-hmm. of working a full time or part time job while I'm training six six to seven hours a day. Mm-hmm. Um, the mental health part that I experienced, I'm able to also pick that out in some of the athletes. So some of them will get really quiet. Some of them will um, start outright crying. So there's a lot of different ways that it manifests within them, within these young athletes. And I'm usually the coach that turns around as soon as I see it coming. I'm like, you put my arm around their shoulder. Hey, come have a walk with me and just talk. Um and being open. And not only that, I think the biggest thing this translates even into how I am in the classroom, and especially teaching something like student success, because we do talk about mental health. And that is a component of that. And I'm very open with the students. And the minute I opened up, and I was and it's funny, because I was told, whatever you do, don't, you know, don't get too personal in the classroom. Mm. And I, I beg to differ that. Ignore because that advice. I yeah. do, because <laughs> Um, especially going through something as massive as mental health. And that's a huge thing that's going on in our, like, we can't deny that now that, that it's, it's now out in our face. Like it is in our face all over social media, all over the press in media, uh, local and that kind of stuff. And, um, having lost a couple students and I, I think I just sort of kind of went, you know what, um, I need to be honest with myself. And the only way I can teach and be honest is to open up and say, hey, guys, I suffer from mental health. And then when I go through the signs and symptoms, these are the and I, yep, I experienced this. How did I experience? So I I try to put it into a way that they're able to understand. But know that somebody else just I'm not just here talking just because I learned about it or have the knowledge about it. I actually experienced it. And and from there, I think the first time I. And I still remember this the first time I sort of kind of came out and I was I was nervous and I had five students after class mm-hmm. come up to me and say, I look, I'm suffering. And it was and it was funny because they were all lined up and the first one and I was thinking, oh, OK, and and I was like, OK, I'll be right back. Walk them down to counseling services and then come back. And I was like, because the, that person had broken down and then the next couple, it was the same thing. And I was wow. like. Wow. And for them to even open up, because not a lot of the times people that suffer from mental health don't they try to keep it because of the stigma. Yeah. And a lot of people try to there's a stereotype of, you know, oh, you're crazy and everything of that nature. And, and the first thing I even say to my class, do I look crazy? Mm-hmm. And, you know, we giggle and laugh about it. But on a serious note, um, I've had I've had over 30 kids that I've actually taken down over my years to counseling services. And mm-hmm. it's just, you know, it, it's something serious and, and, and it's growing mm-hmm. as well. And, and I'm seeing that in, and I coach, mind you, I coach even younger kids. So I coach from five years old all the way to university and pro athletes. So I, I sat there and one of the things is I'm starting to see it even younger mm-hmm. and the pressures, the pressures that come from parents. Well, it's no different than students. Students, I hear like, you know, when we open up sort of kind of the floor, I hear students having a lot of pressure from parents and mm-hmm. so forth. So it, it becomes really hard to to see that and you can't ignore that. Yeah. So, yeah. That's so fascinating, Crystal. And I mean, it seems like a bit of a perfect storm, right? With the pandemic, with social media, like you're saying, it's so, I'm so glad I didn't have social media when I was in high school because <laughs> I don't know if I could have coped with that. And so I just... Um, you know, so with that, and then, yeah, of course, the, the pressure from parents, we hear that in the news all the time, too, parents <laughs> getting really caught up in, in their children's sports, and maybe, you know, with the best of intentions, trying to be encouraging, and it's, 
it it just kind of goes awry and and adds pressure. Yeah, it does. It does add a lot of pressure, and and I definitely see that in dealing with it now um, within our club and the athletes that I deal with, and I see it even uh, watching my daughter's um, provincial volleyball. And I sort of kind of I sit back and I just watch. It's not just girls on the team going through it. It's other teams and you see the parents get like right in there. Why weren't, why didn't you do this? And why, Mm -hmm. you know, or or like, you know, just saying things that are on the negative side, but I know the parents might have good intentions, Mm -hmm. but it's not, that's not the end of it. It's also in the classroom because a lot of the students, if their parents are paying, these are stories that I hear international students, parents are paying and they, you know, um, either sold part of their farm yeah. and to come here. And if they, you know, they think if they don't get a 90 or anything of that nature, they've failed because the pressure is, is real amongst our international students and, yeah. and domestic students as well. But the pressure is there regardless of it's, you know, themselves, peers, um, or parents. And that's a great point, like especially those from more collectivist cultures like India, where you're right, it's one person who's here and doing the studies, but they're kind of representing their whole family in a way. Right. And so a lousy mark on one test or, you know, assignment represents a heck of a lot more than just, oh, I'll study harder next time. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. And so um, I mentioned at the start, you teach within the School of Interdisciplinary Studies. Yes. And that's a really, obviously, diverse <laughs> interdisciplinary school. Um, what types of courses do you teach at Conestoga now? Okay. Well, um, to start, what I did before is I was in health sciences. So I did all the fitness for all the community services, so fire, police, and paramedics. So very similar to what your dad had been doing. Yeah, and it's funny because he... <laughs> It was himself and I guess Colleen that sort of kind of created it. And then I went into from there, they needed teachers to teach like wellness and fitness courses. Wow. My dad created those courses. So, yeah. So it was sort of kind of funny. I'm like, I open up the outline and I'm like, look at it. Dwayne Chad. I'm like, oh, my dad. And I think, you know, and 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 it was funny because I just got finished telling him, oh, yeah, they asked me to teach this course. But he didn't say, oh, that's the course I created. It was just like, oh, OK, have fun. Like, you know, it was just but and that's the beauty of it. He let me sort of kind of become my own. So um, I had things like wellness, the better you um, get fit, which was a fitness course. These are courses that unfortunately I took out. So we're, we're hoping that I can either recreate these courses as general electives back mm-hmm. in because fitness and health and there it's very important in in today's society and most people don't really know where to start how to even create a program for themselves Absolutely. instead of you know always going to a gym or and it's scary because I taught into the fitness and health promotion program so I helped start that and I taught all the courses in there and mm-hmm. I started realizing in the gym a lot of our trainers they're bypassed they were bypassed in a three-day course mm-hmm. whereas we have fitness and health promotion and this sort of kind of gives them more of a base and we I went more into teaching them about the actual human body so anatomy and physiology and that kind of stuff and and it was it's stuff that we took and we took the basics and taught them in these general courses like wellness and um, get fit because they can learn how to actually work out. Um, I would imagine that would have huge appeal as an elective for they, anyone it in was, the college. It like. was huge, but they got rid of it. And I, I think ministry had some issues with like they changed, someone changed wellness for a bit. Like, so I went off and, and started cre- like, you know, working on student success. And then somebody went and changed uh, the outline and then it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't fit to the ministry. So now I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to bring that back because I, a lot of students did, um, they loved it, but they benefited from it. So it's a course, there are courses that they can benefit in the long run as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that was in the, the health sciences. So I did teach all of the, all of the fitness and health promotion program courses. Okay. Um, and then I went into more of kept teaching student success, which I still teach today. Mm-hmm. And the Olympic course, Barb Primu actually created the course. And I remember when she first created it, she came and, you know, somebody said, you might want to go talk to Crystal. So we sat down and and she talked to me and then came up with like a course as she came out with the original course outline and sort of kind of it was a a course that was in class and all assignments were done in class originally. Huh. 
And then we sort of kind of in the OLC. So now I've worked on the OLC course and it's completely changed. Now it's actually, it's almost like a, a history course of the Olympics from ancient Olympics all the way to the present time. Oh, cool. And going through the nitty gritty, like that cheating, like everybody wants mm. to know about the cheating. Like, do you know, like, you know, it, we go oh, through yeah. all that stuff. So the uh, Olympic course and, um, and that's what I'm teaching also right now. So just those two courses I'm really focusing on now. Okay. And the lesson that you brought to share with us today, mm -hmm. which course is this from? Um, this is from, I could go, I, I like teaching period, so I could pick up anything. <laughs> so you could probably name a course and I could go through it with you. Uh, uh, I picked a course called a &P, which is anatomy and physiology. And it was called, uh, it's PNAR. It was, um, I guess it was, it was a PNAR course, which is through Health Sciences 1035. Um, and that's the course that, uh, or the lesson that I picked. Okay. And so at what point in the semester does this particular lesson show up? So this would show up, and, and they still teach this course now. Um, this would show up for anybody in health sciences like nursing, uh, fitness and health promotion, occupational ther uh, therapy, so OTA, PTA, um, respiratory therapy, anybody that needs to deal with the human body, <laughs> this is a, a crucial thing. And it's within the first year, usually in the first term, okay. that they do teach the course. It could have changed and moved to the second term, but uh, when I was teaching it, it was within the first term, which is fitting because you do need to know the human body before mm -hmm. you start, you know, <laughs> probing and That's prodding it. and <laughs> yeah. needles inside all of yes. us. Um, Okay, so first year, usually uh, first semester, perhaps. Yes. And so what is this particular lesson? Tell us about it. So the particular lesson that um, I, I loved teaching was about the circulatory system. Oh. So the heart, the blood, how the blood moves through the system. And it, it brings me back because I was thankful in my university career to have some of my professors actually be hands-on because I was one of those learners that they would talk and I'd be like staring off in a space mm -hmm. because I, it, I just didn't click with me. I had to be hands-on. And I found with anatomy that has to sort of kind of be hands-on because if you look at what this course is actually taught into, so whether it's nursing, fitness, health promotion, uh, occupational therapy, mm -hmm. respiratory therapy, they're all hands-on. They all have to deal with something, either putting you through something, sticking you with needles, sticking something down your throat, whatever it is, they have to deal with the human body. So I think it's very important to turn, I thought it was important to turn this class into more of a hands-on class for some of the components. Yeah. So um, the circulatory system, any system, um, I did this too, but this was the one that I picked. Okay. Yeah. And so what, what are students supposed to be learning about the circulatory system on this particular day in class? So on this particular day in class, they would be learning about the blood flow through the heart. Mm -hmm. um, so throughout the body, I'm going to say throughout the body because I, I had to incorporate the upper and lower body and the lungs as well because that's how the blood goes through there and then it chambers through the heart. Um, so they had to learn about um, the valves, what parts of the heart the blood was moving through, what they were called. And that can be a scary thing, reading it. And the, and the textbook, they still have the same textbook, is actually pretty good because um, it's still in color. So I always hear like students, oh, I like the color. Um, but it's pretty, it's the same textbook. And it was actually pretty good. But I know books can be very scary for, for a lot of students. So, you know, you have the main topics, the subheadings and all that stuff. And you see these little things to the side that might be a definition mm -hmm. and it can be very overwhelming for some. So it was my job to sort of kind of break it down for them. And mind you, this was actually a tutorial. So tutorials, how we look at it here is they come bring a question and you just answer it. If they don't have a question, you're done. And that was it. <laughs> okay. And that's sort of kind of how they told us, you know, to go through it. And I was like, and I remember going through the first time I taught it and I said, this just isn't right. Cause the students are sitting there like, and I could see them, they wanted to ask a question. And we all know students, they, they sometimes fear the professors. They think, oh, yeah. you know, or even like a fear of asking questions. So I started developing like sheets, uh, like study sheets and they'd fill it in. 
Okay. As I was going through it. So I was actually teaching in these tutorials. I wasn't just, okay, bring a question. What question do you have? You're breaking was, the rules a little bit I, to make I sure did, students walked I did in I did because they, they, I wanted them to know it. And it, and it really hit home because um, I wasn't the only one. So there, I mean, it's there's so many nursing students and so forth. But we looked at the first test and I, uh, my jaw dropped because I was just stunned at how many students didn't do that well. Yeah. And so I asked my section, I was like, so what's going on? And they're like, it's just a lot of words. And I don't know, like, you know, like it talks about a tricuspid valve and what's the difference between bicuspid and tricuspid. And I realized I got to sort of kind of break this down. Like, so it was like, okay, we'll try three and bi is two. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if, if you see the picture and it's got three little things, that's the tricuspid. Like, you know, it was sort of kind of things like that. And, and I realized if one person, if one student has this question, I bet you the whole class has this question. So in this particular lesson, I decided um, just on a whim at home, like the day before, and I was like, so I went and got all my duct tape and and tape, (laughs) and I went early. So I actually booked a class that I can have. I had like three sections and booked a class that I can have and not change anything because I taped the floor. Oh, so I literally put tape on the floor and I outlined the heart. So I had um, what like a a board, like a little Bristol board that said upper body, lower body. I drew the chamber, or I shouldn't say drew. I taped the chambers of the heart mm. and taped the valves, and then had the main arteries as well. And then going and I had the lungs, and from there the students would turn around and they would get either a red dot well start up red or a blue dot and that represented sort of kind of what we what we look at in the anatomy pictures the color of the blood okay and they had to walk through Mm -hmm. the chambers Mm. and not only did they have to walk through they had to say what it was that they were walking through (laughs) and after that I'll tell you after that lesson the students were like oh my gosh that what like why don't people just teach like this? Like, you know, and I, and I started also realizing just because we're in college doesn't mean we can forget about the fun and games and oh, yeah. that kind of stuff. And that's something that um, I know my dad had sort of kind of tried to instill in me was cooperative learning. And it's mm-hmm. a lot of game stuff and, and, and hands on work. So that was something that that I that worked for that lesson. Wow. And I mean, yeah, I think you're so right. We focus like often when we look at the learning outcomes at the college, they're so much in the cognitive realm, right? Like yes. label this, define that. And we forget that psychomotor learning is so is so key as yep. is affective. I'm on a bit of a crusade to, you know, bring more affective learning into the classrooms, too, because I think we're all feeling humans and, you know, the, <laughs> the things we're defining impact us and, and how we feel in class matters. But but yeah, this it, I just I could see why it would seem playful and also really help with learning retention for them to walk through with their little blue or red dot and, yep. you know. And then and then they'd have like almost like a call for help and then or like other people would be standing around and they have a sheet and mm-hmm. it was a blank sheet of, like with the heart and the lungs and all the same thing that's on the floor and they can label it. So I had mm-hmm. I left it blank. They can label it. And then at the front of the class, I put the, the answer. So on the board, I just kind of put the answers and they go up and flip the chart and look to see. And from there, it became, okay, this is how you guys would study this. Doesn't mean you have to put it on the floor, but you see you can get blank pictures Mm -hmm. and so forth, and we go from there. Um, I just didn't do it for the circulatory system. I did it for, like, every system. So we're looking at, like, you know, how the nervous system and um, also the respiratory system. So I would do things not necessarily on the floor all the time. It might be, okay, I on a Bristol board, draw something and like conduction of the heart. And I'd have these little sticky things that you can, okay, place where the pacemaker would be place Mm -hmm. where the note, like, you know, and just, they'd have to place little things down and they go through it. And I'd have different, different stations also set up as well. And it's not just this class that I, that I've done this on. It's even like something like student success, um, you know, and it's, it becomes fun and learning becomes fun. And I just find that they now actually want to come to class. Hmm. (laughs) Do you find it's impacted their ability to like actually ask questions? Like whereas before. Yes. So now, and I do, because when you're sitting in a class and just imagine you're sitting in a class as a, as a professor, a teacher, instructor, we're sitting at the front. We've been there. Yeah. 
And some of us were probably the ones that asked the questions all the time, but a majority of your classmates didn't want to ask. They were scared. So we have to remember to reverse and play the reversal type thing of what we felt mm -hmm. at that time. And when you're sitting in a class of 30 to 45 students, do you really want to put up your hand and you think it's the like and they'll be like, I have a stupid question. I'm like, mm -hmm. there's no such thing as a stupid <laughs> question, because here's the thing. Guarantee you, you're going to ask it. But I guarantee you there's at least five other students thinking it. Yeah. Right now. So by being more active and putting them into into that kind of setting, um, I found as they were going through it, oh, I can't remember. Oh, what is this? And mm -hmm. so they were able to, to ask questions, but it just didn't allow me to answer. Now the other students also became teachers as well. Right. So and that's the same thing in the track world. We have our younger or, or I shouldn't say younger. They are younger athletes, but the older ones actually coach the younger ones or help with the younger ones because you actually learn and it brings a different setting of learning. So mm -hmm. I like to do that also in the classroom as well is, you know, learn how to teach others. If you don't have anybody to teach, go stand in front of the mirror and talk to yourself and teach yourself yeah. and just repeat because now you're hearing it. So we're getting different modalities of what goes into memory as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, you know, oh, I'm just writing a sensory now, like we have auditory, we have like a whole bunch of different senses that are going in and they actually stimulate memory. So um, we have to play into that. Yeah. And it's so like when you describe how, you know, the tutorial was initially designed and it was just like, all right, if you've got questions, you bring them <laughs> here. That's a lot to put on students, right? If they've just like half read through or maybe completely read through this textbook with diagrams they don't understand, they might not even know what their question is, right? And exactly. but then when they're up there on the floor walking through and they're like, oh, yeah, I understand this part of the heart. But then, oh, I'm stuck here. It's so it seems like visceral in a way. And then then it becomes clear what they should even ask, whereas you know, if you if you haven't had that experience, how do you even form the question and, sometimes? And, and you're absolutely right. Because I do I do find that um, sometimes, well, we get told that we have to teach away or something. It's it's not really told that we have to suggested. And I'll be honest, I had a full class, started with a full class, and Teachers that were teaching the tutorial at the same time, I'm like, look, I remember the next class after that, I was like, uh, people are sitting on the floor. Who are you guys? Oh, we're coming. Are we allowed to be in this class? I heard how oh. you. And then some of the teachers started coming, like the other professors were like, what the heck are you doing? Like I heard mm. and I just sat there and I said, like, I'm actually teaching the lesson. Like I have one hour. They go. It's an online course. They're going through it. Anatomy is your bread and butter. Mm -hmm. I don't care what anybody says. It's your bread and butter of all the foundation of anybody dealing with your body. So, I mean, I don't think you want a nurse to poke you with a needle That's and right. can't draw the blood <laughs> because they don't know what the vein or the like, you know, they, they don't is, know. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I, I just thought it's, it's worth putting in the effort. And yeah, did it take time? Yeah, I had to go in 30 minutes early. Crawl on your hands and to, knees. And <laughs> <laughs> to lay it out and that kind of stuff. Or take the weekend to draw a couple of posters up and maybe get my kids to color. Like, I mean, they all, my kids would color, you know, scribble or like toddlers and everything yeah. else at that point. But um, it's worth it. And it does stimulate questions. And that's when all of a sudden, well, you know, well, so when there's a heart attack and they, what happens with, so then those kind of questions start coming up and that's, mm -hmm. they're important because that's actually right within the chapter yeah. and the next section that we have to teach. So now they, they see hands on what the anatomy is, but they also got to walk through it and actually, you know, and, and a lot of them said when they got to the test, they were picturing themselves walking through the different sections, which was awesome to hear. Oh, yeah. So they could bring it back up to memory as opposed to a bunch of words. Mm. Well, and it's so interesting. John Tibbetts has been speaking lately about practical wisdom and this idea that that's one of the things that might, you know, get us out of all of this trouble with AI. And, you know, and that's one of the things we really want to teach students is like, OK, yeah, you're going to be in these imperfect systems or industries or whatever field it may be. And yes, there's going to be rules, but sometimes you know, you kind of got to use your practical wisdom and navigate your way through it to find the solution that's really feeling right for you and the other people there. It sounds to me like that's exactly what you did with yeah. these and tutorials, it's using, right? it's using common sense, but it's also, I think, teaching the students to jump out of the box sometimes. Like, yeah. do you have to, like, I mean, what do we do? We tell them, oh, like, 
how to study and okay, read and then take your notes. Hmm. Well, not every, and I'll be honest, I used to read and I didn't get good grades in, in school until a professor came out to me and was like, but you're, you're explaining everything in lab, but your tests aren't showing it. And I was like, he's like, how is your, how are you studying? And I said, I just read the textbook and not, not mm-hmm. thinking, I never took notes. Mm-hmm. And what do a majority of students do? Like, let's be honest with ourselves mm-hmm. now. They're not taking notes. Yeah. They are definitely not taking notes. So that's one of the ways is I found to help them take notes is to actually, and I know a lot of people are like, I'm not supplying them, but I actually supply them with blank of, you know, I'll have different things. They have to fill in the blank. There you go. Yeah. That becomes a study guide for them. And then I turn around before the test and explain, okay, bring those papers back if you have them still. Mm -hmm. And this is your study guide. Mm. So keep everything short and sweet, just how it is in, in the point form or uh, fill in the blank. Uh, draw your diagrams. You guys have diagrams here. Um, it's accessibility. That's what it comes down to because most stu- most people and students, if we're talking about students, they're not going to take the notes. They'll sit there, literally sit there, and just to, for the attendance sake. And you hear that a lot. Like, oh, there's there's no engagement in class. Well, we have to create that. It's not, yeah. now we do. We, we really, like, there's a, a different trend of, or uh, I guess, yeah, a trend of student if I, that's come about because I think even from my kids being uh, 13 and, and 16, one is she's very in the classroom, whereas my son is just, he's one of those kids that would sit there and, mm-hmm. Yeah. Like not reaching him. literally yeah. sit there just as we are right now and probably stare at each other and, and, you know, and then have 5 million questions going through his head, but he doesn't want to ask it because he doesn't want to look stupid. Right. Um, so I, we have to, we, we're the ones that have to create that to allow the students the most of their learning careers. Yeah. And how to, I like the expression, like, and how to work smarter, not harder, right? Like they might be Absolutely. reading those chapters and, but yeah, maybe don't know how to take notes effectively. And so having someone like you who's distilling down and curating the content of the textbook, textbook for them and saying, here, here's a one pager that's the most important. You're going to fill in the blanks as you mm-hmm. walk through this. You know, that's a huge, a huge assistant. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I think teaching student success was a huge thing as well. With, mm-hmm. student, with student success, I could... Um, <clears throat> We have note taking, we have building a schedule Mm -hmm. and when to start studying, all those kind of things within the class. So that did help. And especially in all the other classes that I did taught, I actually brought that in. If I could say there's one class I think every professor, teacher should teach is something like a student success Mm -hmm. to understand sort of kind of what the students generally need and um, the awareness that they all don't know how to study for a test Yeah, or note take in that fact. Yeah. Wow, Crystal, I have so many more questions, but we are almost (laughs) at our time for today. So I like to wrap up these sessions by asking faculty participants if there's something about you, kind of quirky fact or anything at all, that you think some of your students and colleagues might not know yet that you'd like to share here. Well, I did. I think I sort of kind of mentioned it, but I did teach a couple um, or not teach. I coached a couple professional teams and I did speed training um, with Atlanta and New Orleans um, NFL. And I've also had some NBA and um, NHL teams that I worked with uh, for speed and agility. Really? Yes. Is there one that particularly stands out or you're especially proud of because it was challenging or? uh... No, I just, I have fun doing it. Mm. So I'm, I feel like I'm in my element, just like when I'm teaching, I'm in my element. So it's not, it's not challenging. I wouldn't say it's challenging. Uh, Maybe the only thing that was challenging was I was a female Mm. and how an all male team is going to look at a female telling them, (laughs) <laughs> How did training get faster? Like, <laughs> so yeah, that was, I think that would be the only thing, but really, and honestly, I think once I got started, but not only that, I just, I mean, in that I'm a different trainer when I'm teaching or working with them, I'm, mm-hmm. I am hard and mm-hmm. you know, and they, and they're serious too. So they're not quite fooling around. And if they are, mm-hmm. then <laughs> <laughs> lots of push ups and everything else, right? Whatever it comes down to you, but, but yeah, it's, it was fun. It was fun. Wow. Well, it's clear you bring so much expertise and joy 
to all that you do. So uh, I, it doesn't surprise me that, that they reacted well and that um, your students just adore you too. Thanks, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, we have come to the end of another episode of My Favorite Lesson, a podcast hosted by Teaching and Learning at Conestoga College. You can find all episodes in this series and more by following Teaching and Learning at Conestoga on YouTube. You can also find this podcast on Spotify and other places you get your podcasts. If you subscribe, you'll be notified each time a new episode becomes available. For 24-7 support for all things teaching and learning related, please check out our Faculty Learning Hub at tlconestoga.ca. I'm Dr. Lauren Spring, reminding you, as the great Bell Hooks once said, that the classroom, with all its limitations, remains a location of possibility. Until next time.